We've got an interesting one in tonight, and this is Andy's EVH Bumblebee. Uh, yeah, and in many ways, a very well made guitar. Um, should have everything going for it. I mean, it's got the got the looks. It's got the heel adjuster that you can get to for your truss rod. It's got the locking stuff. It's got decent tuners. It's got a nice Strat-like neck in maple. Uh, a Floyd Rose EVH branded, and the the EVH sorry the EVH thingy there. Familiar looking tremolo um, mounting bolts for the uh, locking nut at the end. And so what isn't right about this? Well, um, so, so I think something's happened with this guitar over time that's spooked Andy. And I don't mean that in any critical way. I mean it in the way that it's very common that when something goes wrong with a guitar, by the way, there's a loose um, button. Uh, when something goes wrong with a guitar, and it, in a sense it's a fairly complex one in that it's got lots of different interrelated parts with the Floyd Rose and this and that. And it's simple in terms of its um, tone controls and one pickup. <coughs> but in terms of its balance, Floyd Rose is, I suppose, can drive you completely nuts. And then if one thing goes wrong or you can't get, get it the way you want it, then the whole thing kind of feels bad and then you can start trying different things to make it work. And before you know it, you can be sort of miles off and just saying to yourself, oh, this just doesn't work, I can't get this to work. So Andy's brought it to me with an interesting problem in that, first of all, he said to me that um, he doesn't like to use these tuners because his palm, when he's playing, his palm gets in the way and, and uh, detunes them. Well, I mean, the point about those tuners, the first thing I thought, yeah, okay, yeah, I get that. You know, that's annoying, isn't it? But you can't take them out of the equation. That's the first thing. So they're going to do that whether his palm hits them or not. So that's a, that's a kind of, I suppose it ends up being a technique challenge that you have to find a way not to hit them um, because you can't, I mean, the only way you'll take them out of the equation is to take the knobs off altogether, take these adjusters off altogether and have it set at its maximum upness and then do everything after that. But we're not, do, well, he hasn't done that because they are there in position. So, so currently those are annoying him and going out of tune. The tremolo is decked so it's flat on the back and only goes forward. Now this is a, there's no recess under here so it was never designed to um, tilt backwards into there. If you want it to float you have to have it starting off with a tilt, like a like a standard tremolo, or sorry, a Strat, conventional Strat tremolo, even though it's called a Floyd Rose and it's got two posts, it'll still, you would still need to cant the end up to have some backward or up bend. But it's currently set flat against the deck with quite a bit of string power there to try maybe hold it in tune. It's wearing a set of tens. When you look up close at this, we've got pretty big jumbo frets on here. Um, and I think this part could be one of the problems because Andy's experience of this guitar is you play the B and the G down here and they go out of tune all the time and I concur on that I've been playing it at home and finding out my god it does go out of tune and it's it's very easy to go out of tune when you look at the first sort of culprit of going out of tune playing down near the first fret um, these heights aren't excessive but they could do with um, a smaller reduction um, to as low as possible. Um, and then what we've got is the locking caps on, which are just basically being put on in a sort of holding um, mode. So they're not really doing, or shouldn't be doing anything, um, but actually they appear to be tightened down. So they're a mixture of not doing something because they're upside down. So they either are or kind of part aren't doing something. So well, let's let's take them off for a minute. So anyway, so this is just an un unhappy combination of things. Um, and I think that, uh, oh, one of the things I noticed when I was um, test playing it is that when I was um, pressing the tremolo down, it actually went sharp when it came back. 
then I, um, what did I do? I'd pull the string, it would go flat, press it down, it would go sharp. So I suspected personally that something to do with this thing randomly holding down these uh, locking doofers. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so I, I thought, well, what, what's the best way around this? Um, the action is where Andy wants it, and that's fine, and the neck relief seems to be pretty much on the mark. It's nothing excessive or too little or anything. So we've got a thing here that is going sharp on playing these notes. One thing to note is that Andy has this tuned to E flat. So we've got tens tuned to E flat on a Strat scale um, with some locking nuts here that are getting in the way at the moment and with some tuners that he doesn't like. Also, I noticed um, when I came to play it, one of the other factors that would, I think would really just, um, what am I doing? I'm trying to put this in place. Um, yeah, another thing that would uh, really complicate the experience of trying to figure out what the hell's going on to get the guitar the way you'd like it. And that was, is that um, the strings Andy has on here, being tens, were um, unstretched, unstretched out. So they were going out of tune all over the place. So well, the reason I'm mentioning that is because if you're trying to figure out why something isn't working and you've, you've got an extra variable or complication in the system, which is these strings are going to go out of tune every time you kind of grab them or pull them or anything them. Um, what's going to happen is your understanding or your ability to make sense of what's going on in here and find the culprit is completely uh, reduced altogether. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Um, actually, what I'm going to do, let's, let's do something here. Let's take the tremolo out of the mix. And I'm going to, as I suggested to Andy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set all of this up to kind of as near to hard tail as we can get, just to sort of cut all the variables out. Then when it's hard tailed-ish, I'm going to um, stretch out all the strings. And what I want to do is I want to find whether this thing plays, um, which point it plays reliably. Or uh, put another way, as uh, as I'm trying to figure out what's causing the notes played near the, f the nut to go high, um, what I'm going to do is I take, take all the other variables out of the question so we can just focus on that one. Okay, so I've hardtailed that as near as damn it. It's not going to go anywhere. So now I'm going to stretch all of these out. Now this guitar is going to, it's got no locking nuts on at the moment, so it's going to, as near as damn it, it's going to play as a, um, that's what I hate about these. Right, I'm going to put a set of ten, tens on. Um, that's the problem with trying to figure things out. You break things. Uh, let's have a look. Tens, 46. And that cut me, that one. Gosh darn thing cut me. Right, so let's let's go backwards in time. Let us find this yeah we'll we'll go back backwards we'll put new strings on just for just for sacrificial strings since since I've um I've gone and bust one of the originals let's put a new set on and that way we can just treat everything the same from the beginning so what we've got here is the strings have been put on I think it's the Eddie Van Halen way which is put them through there and let the ball do the holding why not so that's what we'll do again. Um, that's, it's good and as good a place to put them as any, otherwise you're cutting the thing at both ends. Um, I, I do remember having a guitar once that I thought was a superb guitar, a Japanese-made sort of 80s Matsumoku, Matsumo, Matsumoku, Matsumoto, that's the one, you know the one from the famous Jolly Good Factory. Um, by the way, these strings are reinforced Ernie Balls, which I've got here especially for this, so I will put them on in the end again, but not right now. Um, yeah, so I had this uh, Yamaha SE 350, it was called, and um, I probably should just cut this end off here. SE 350, and um, <laughs> maybe I shan't cut it off there. And I'm tell you, about to tell you the really good thing about it was that... Um, 
it had in the tremolo end, it had a Yamaha patented, patented tremolo. It kind of worked on the Floyd Rose style, but it was designed such that it had um, receptacles for the ball end of the string so that you did away with this clamping business, which is, I think, where this string just broke, at the metal clamp, because the, whenever you're holding strings in place with sheer brute force like that, you are weakening them, and there's no doubt about it. So it seems to me a bit of a, a dopey um, thing to, to use that method. That's why I don't, I don't massively rate the um, uh, Floyd Rose in that respect. I've got this thing now I've got to take off here. I'm going to, there's a kind of bender <laughs> bender device, um, the drop D thing. I'm going to take it off because uh, we don't need it complicating things. So you can see what I'm trying to do is strip this back to the the, the, sheer, the absolute basics. Um, do I actually know how this comes off? Uh, uh, obviously, it has to take this scrub screw out. Why doesn't it come off? Gosh darn it. Well, it will do eventually if I can. Uh, uh, right, I guess I would need to press it forward to get it off, wouldn't I? Wouldn't I? I guess I would. <laughs> yeah. Which I don't want to do under massive pressure. So hold on a second. Just bear with me. Thank you. See if I can get this thing on. I didn't put it on, so I don't know. It's... it's 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 workings. Um, all right, so it's got a little grub screw here, but I don't know how it stays on there. What, what's the device on the end here? Is that another hex arrangement? Sorry. Oop. There's a hex key in there. Well, there is, but that's too big. Well, the hex in there is the the one we're using to hold the string on. So let's take the whole thing off and take the what's it off this way. Now, that's fine. I'm going to put the little grub screw back in. Sorry, you can't see this in close up. Um, I'm, I'm just going to leave everything off for a minute because what we're what we want to do is just keep it da down to a minimum to find out what's not working, if anything. So I'm putting this. Thing, but ah, right. Sorry, I've got there's a spring that goes with this bender thing, which doesn't apply to the other units. The problem is, there's a risk that it will get lost. I think there's no other strings, springs going on in there, are there? Let's just double check. I don't think there are. No, there never normally isn't. It is right. So I'll put this in a little container along with there's a an intonation tool here as well for this. Um, okay. Wow. How much longer? Oh, uh, right. There's an extra long thingy to fit that on. Maybe that comes... Does it come on the guitar? Because I just took it off. Because... Why did I take it off? Because I don't want it to get in the way. Maybe it's not meant to be taken off. It's just a longer... It's got a longer what's it than the others. Mm. Well, I can put it back on, but I don't want it to play a part in this. Really, oh well. Let's see if it will just work without doing any thing. Yeah, I guess it's a special, additional um, unit that goes with this. If I can see what I'm doing, get that in there. I guess you have to have it in. Or you lose it. I just don't want it. I don't want it having any effect on this, because what I want is for it to remove this block. Right. All right. We'll just leave it in. But it's. I can be confident that it's not playing any part in the deal. So I'm undoing the little um, the hex bolts at the end to release the clamping blocks, and that's got rid of our original set of strings, which we'll put some new ones on just for the hell of it. I mean, the only reason I'm doing that rather than just one is because I've got a whole set here. They're only about a pound a set, and I might as well just fit one. There's an interesting little finish crack down there. Um, yeah, these, these are quite jumbo-y, these frets. 
And um, so, if you think about the the if you have thinking about the jumbo fret thing, um, so coming back to why do why do notes played near the the nut go out of tune? And I'm running. I've basically taken myself out of the game in terms of space to do any drawings. But um, so when you have a high first fret action, okay, so there's your nut, okay, and you have your string coming out of the nut, so, and way above the first fret. Yes, yes, you can see that. When you have a high first fret action, you, to, in order to make it play, you have a long way to press the string down to make it touch the fret, and then off it goes back up the other way. And that, the, the more, the greater that distance is, the more the, f the string is going to be sharp before it even touches the fret to make a note. So as soon as it's pressed down to the fret, the greater that distance is, the more sharp it will be. Now you can't have no distance at all, but you can have a sort of minimum distance or minimal distance. And the rule of thumb I've found, and it can be different for different people, because if you remember, your <laughs> I'm going to draw a finger. There you go. I hope that's a finger. <gasps> your finger pressing down on this thing is going to be pressing down with a different force than mine. But in principle, I've found that anything greater than 0.5 of a millimeter at the first fret on any string is a likelihood increases the likelihood of that note playing sharp no matter how lightly you try and play it. So I found that the happy target, well, I found that it will play with as little as 0.1 millimeters. In fact, that's just about, for a standard playing action at the other end, that's about what you get when you put a capo on the guitar or use a zero fret. You get about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters. But I found that the happy conservative medium or safe medium is about 0.3 around about there. It's safely underneath the zone that causes um, the notes to play sharp, but it's um, not so little that it will cause buzz on the strings. Now, that people try to kind of have other ways of setting that. Um, now, what I, what I can't do at this point is um, uh, de demonstrate it because two things. One is this is a, a slightly complicated system here. We've got a metal nut, and the only way we're going to make a difference to this if it needs to rise or lower, raise or lower, is to um, check if it's got shims underneath. And if it has, then we will have the opportunity to remove some of the shims. If it doesn't, um, then we have to, if it's straight on the wood, we have to sand down a little bit from the underside of this block, which is perfectly possible to do. Just have to be very careful with our measurements. Um, but again, it, it's on the plus side, these things usually come with shims underneath it. and. You know, from our point of view, if we go too far with sanding on the block, then we can always put some brass sheet under there as well, which is exactly what it, they do in the factory. So that's for a bit later. Well, let's just concentrate, first of all, on getting some new strings on, and then we'll get this thing um, stretched up. So we're trying to remember at this stage, we're trying to minimize the number of variables at play so that we can ascertain the number one problem, which is why are these things... Why are these strings going sharp at the uh, near the first fret? Now, like I said, you, you can hear from what I'm saying, and if you've watched my videos before, you'll know that my first culprit for that problem, and, and Andy knows this because we talked about it before and when we messaged each other about it, um, but you'll know that the first culprit that I go to is always the... Um, well, of course, I'm not, it's not a bloody strat, is it? It's a locking thing. Excuse me. Yeah, the first culprit is always the uh, um, fret height, uh, first fret height. Uh, so in this case, I don't think it can be that um, because it's fairly, well, if it, if it is that, it's very sensitive to it. So I'm going to have to have a, a look and see what happens. So the first thing I'm going to do is pull these strings right the way through, and then we have to have a little bit left over to um, lock into here. Now, the, the way to do this is you have to leave a bit of excess here because um, you, you, you're going to cut a bit extra, but there's no exact amount of extra you need to cut, so you just need to cut a little bit extra and take up whatever slack there is. The danger is if you cut too short, but if you cut too long, you'll take, it, take the slack up on here. So I'm starting with that. 
which is a guess because I don't use these guitars every day. So there's my, um, I'm going to bend a little bit of an angle on it. I'm going to find my correct, um, right, it's this one at the end, isn't it? The bigger one. Find the correct one, and I'm going to then push this end bit into there, and I'm going to tighten up the crushing force of the block. And I really hate squeezing it that tight. Then we've got a bit of slack in here, but I'm going to take it up at this end, take it up with this end. Now, in this case, um, Andy set, uh, he's put the, um, I should have done this before, he's put the uh, retainer bar, or there is a retainer bar on, and it, it looks like the guitar, obviously the guitar comes with it, um, and he's tightened it quite a long way down. He's pointed out to me that he has and said, I don't know if that's a problem. In other words, the break angle on here is quite extreme. The brake angle isn't necessary if you're using the locking tuners in the way that they were. Ah, I can't take your finger out before you do that. In, they, in the way they were designed, um, because the locking nuts will take care of the brake angle. Um, in other words, creating a clean launch point. So we don't really have to worry about that. So the brake angle, if it's too much, it's not a problem either. The, the lock, providing the, when we've got the locking thingies on there it'll certainly make no difference at all but we're going to use it without the locking things for a minute while we just or are we what are we going to do just let me get my head around this are we going to go straight for the the full effect uh, well I mean I was thinking through um, Andy's point about not liking to use these and I guess what he means is if he knocks these out of tune with his hands, he doesn't like to try and tune it back up that way. He likes to be able to grab and retune up the other end, um, which is, which I think makes sense. It's more familiar. Um, now, um, I, I think for me, that seems a bit of a, an overall loss of the sort of precision of the, or the, the nice benefits of the Floyd Rose. Um, you know, to, to lose those, so you can ignore this. Um, I, I think it seems to me just a bit of a, a, a shame, really. I, I would, I would want to have to, you know, use the the benefits of the Floyd Rose. Um, however, or let's put it another way, if I if I was definitely only using this as a, basically a hard tail with a, with a bit of down tuning, i.e., a basic strap. Um, then I would um, make sure to take these little uh, knobs off if that's the way I was really going to play it. But uh, we can come to that decision a bit later on or another day or whenever Andy takes this back, um, you know, and we'll, we'll worry about that. I can see where I'm going. Worry about that then. It's something he can do and it will change nothing except for, um, you know, he can... I mean, it may, I'm just trying to think if you take it off, it changes the action slightly because these press down to um, raise this up. Raise me up. Yeah, what you have to have, you better watch out to not to cut it too short because you have to have enough room to fit this string all the way in. Obviously, you don't want so much room that you've got to wind it forever, but. But you need some. Anyway, let's 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 begin by treating this as a standard guitar, which first of all shouldn't play sharp at the nut end. All right, that's the first challenge we've got. And we've got to get it playing so it plays without going sharp at that end. And once we've done that, then we can consider whether we want it with locking tuners or without or so on. But the point I guess I'm making is that the going sharp at the nut end is independent of the business of locking tuners. It's, it's got no, bears no physical relation. So I'm cutting these now a little bit longer because I'd rather have a bit more around my uh, tuner post at the other end than not be able to get it into the locking bit down there. Um, now these are fairly cheap strings, so that I've got to be careful with the stretching so that they don't break in the process of doing it. But that's the most important thing I would recommend is if you've got a problem and you it, it involves a bunch of 
variables that are sort of doing your head in. You know, if you're not mathematical minded like me, and you know, it's always it's been something I've learned, which is to reduce the number of variables as fast as you can, get them down to as close to one, because you can you can kind of assess one variable and what it's doing. Uh, if you have multiple variables all interacting with each other, then quite understandably, and there's that bloody ball end of that other one. Uh, yeah, quite understandably, multiple variables. Now that's stuck in there at the moment. I'm just going to have to leave it in there for the period. It's not getting in the way of anything, but when we've done, I must remember to pull it out. You will tell me, won't you? Um, yeah, so cut the cut the variables down to as few as possible, and you know it's it's a bit like that. This also applies when you come. Oh God, <laughs> I forgot to push it under the retainer bar. Um, it also applies. That same thing applies when you're doing electronics, and you know you put a bunch of wiring together, and then it doesn't work the first time, or somebody brings you something that isn't working, um, and says, "Can you?" Can you f diagnose what's wrong with somebody else's wiring and put it right? And that's a, a really difficult thing to do. And the only chance you've got of figuring out what's wrong is to the same thing, to cut down the number of possible variables in it. So I basically iron out all the things that could change and endeavor to change only one thing at a time. And that way you can track what change it makes or what goes wrong or right. Now, I would say to Andy at this point, if you're definitely not going to use the locking nuts, don't put them on there the way you had them because they were interfering with play even though they were only lightly tacked down. So that would be adding another variable to complicate the equation. So we don't need that. Um, it may not be relevant, but it doesn't help that it's in, you know, in the mix. So take it out. Oops, I'll just put a kink in that, but we don't care. Not at this point. Right, throw these here bits of leftover string away. Grab a bit of squash from the squash department. Right, so our task now is to treat it like an ordinary cheap strap with um, a six, let's call it, imagine it's a six screw tremolo and um, no locking nut uh, and we're just going to look to make it play as a effectively a hard tail. We're not even bothered with the tremolo at the moment. So I'm just going to do some stretchings. Hopefully I won't bust this one, but you never know. That's a, the downside of, that's why the, the Yamaha I was mentioning was better than this Floyd Rose design, because the Floyd Rose, to hold the string in place, you're by definition half breaking it. It won't hold unless you have enough force crushing it against the block at the bridge end. Poor old bridge end, it always gets a bad wrap. Anyway, uh, yeah, so you have to crush it with pretty much massive force. And that, that's kind of half breaking it from the outset. Um, so therefore, it always wants to break. Now the good thing about having this set, not as a, exactly a hardtail, but a down only tremolo setting, is that um, you don't have to worry about floating, uh, floating this thing. 
and getting it into equilibrium. Um, so that's a sort of a, a hassle kind of off, off your mind. Um, so I'm just going to keep on stretching now. I'm doing right now something I would normally show at the end of a setup, which is how much you need to physically stretch out strings before you um, play the guitar. And this applies almost more to a complex tremolo system like the Floyd Rose, because the Floyd Rose is going to challenge you to balance out and equalize the pull of both the springs in one direction and the strings in the other before you lock anything down. But as soon as you lock something down, if you haven't stretched out all the slack, you'll be undoing all those bolts. Before you know it, having to rebalance in a new position and locking everything again. Now that process alone, I can imagine if somebody has a kind of um, worried impression of Floyd Roses, and they find this thing, you know, locking it down, it goes straight out of tune. Your first thing probably would be to say the tremolo's rubbish going out of tune when in fact what's happening is that your strings are just going out of tune because they are um, they aren't stretched fully out now I you know I can't emphasize enough how long the slack in your strings can stay in there and how long it can keep on sort of leaking out the slack to make your strings go out of tune and and if you've got this um, you know a tremolo like the Floyd Rose where if your strings continue to shed slack once you've locked everything in your Floyd Rose down, it, including, it's not just locking things down, it's, it's including the fact that you set, you have to set your micro tuners up um, mostly with downward you know, movement, but a little bit in both directions. You have to be able to do it. But when you, when this goes out of tune more and more because the strings aren't stretched fully, you're down at the stops of these, then you have to unlock everything, <laughs> slack it out, undo all of these to nearly at the top position, tune it up by ear, lock it down here, tune it precisely here, and if it's still got slack in it, you'll play it a bit with the tremolo and it'll be out of tune all of a sudden. And it's easy to think that the tremolo isn't doing what it should, when in fact, um, you know, looking at this, it looks like everything about this tremolo should do exactly what it's supposed to do. So it's really, there's so many variables that it's easy to freak yourself out about it. So my suggestion is take it back to the simplest level treat it like a, a guitar. Now, what I don't like straight away is the locking nut. The strings are not moving smoothly through this nut because I can tell because the um, the what do you call it the the movement or the tuning change as I turn the tuner is not linear or progressive. These have been worn out almost to a breaking point here, so this isn't good. Um, we'll probably replace these, but I have to hold off that. In fact, this one is knackered, so we've got a problem here. We'll We'll have to live with this as it stands. I'll replace them after we get rid of this. They're, they've been stuffed at the end. So they changed tune, yes, because I've released some of the tension on them. Uh, I would like to get them off now because that's just pointless trying to do this. But it's not the biggest impact in the world, but it's just not going to help us having duff, uh, duff things. We don't want it to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slack all these off, which probably doesn't help these cheap strings one little bit because they're probably going to want to snap once I re-tighten them up and then once I stretch them again. But what I want to do here is I want to be able to press these down and I'm going to grasp the end of this knackered screw and with, if I can find the thing, uh, it has escaped me. The meaning of all I 
you before escapes me. I'm thinking of Genesis. Right, so I'm destructively removing this uh, knackered screw because it is knackered and there's absolutely no point keeping it in there because we will not get any good service out of it. If I were to show it to you in, in glorious close-up. Uh, oh, excuse my fingers. Look at that. Mashed. Dead. Gone. Doink. Yeah, I've got, I haven't got a disease, I've just got loads of stain. <laughs> my fingers are stained and I'm not smoking too much. I'm not smoking at all, by the way. I don't smoke. Never have, never will. Again. <sighs> um, yeah, so... Do I replace both? Let's replace both to make them look the same, I think. Um, I mean, technically speaking, you know, if we're talking about sim simplification, what's the angle here? Let's check the angle. No, that probably does need it. Um, I was thinking we might just keep it simple by removing the uh, what's it's all together. Now, that's interesting. It's, cut, it's kind of ground into there a little bit. I guess it does. I guess it has to. Right, I've got some replacement uh, screws, which hopefully, um, they're a bit taller, so I won't want to go in so far, but um, it's just far enough to get a little bit of a brake angle. That's all we need. Yeah, fresh screws, baby. Okay. Um, in fact, what I really want to do is use the better thing for that, a more closely fitting thing. Let's have a look. Tiny bit down with this one. That's more than likely enough. Right, here we go again. Opposite direction. So, yeah, so the, the principle being, as I said, to just reiterate, by the time you've kind of got a few of these variables messing you around, and then by the time the slack in the string is all over the place so that nothing seems to stay in tune, you can, it's very easy to be quickly in kind of just a mental mind <coughs> censored, um, you know, with a Floyd Rose, and it's, it's totally understandable. So that's why I suggest that we go back to basics. Yeah, back to basics because when all said and done, and it always is said and done, this is a guitar with a wooden neck, some frets, and it's got a bridge at one end and a saddle at the other. And the neck has a bit of curvature in it, and you've got some strings of a familiar gauge which behave in a particular way, a fairly dependable way. And so that it, it, if we stripped away all of this and just showed you a kind of an old, simple six-string guitar you know, with nothing fancy going on, ordinary tuners, ordinary bone nut or whatever. This is the same. Tuning stable. like this nut at all. This nut has got some grooves in it and it's causing drag on the string. It's not tuning properly. Well, not directly.
So what we want to do we just want to keep on playing until we get this thing stretched out and it stays stable. Right, that's as near as tuned as we're going to get on this bog standard guitar with nothing complicated going on. So now let's get a um, thing, cable, and we'll plug it in our totally ordinary guitar with a sort of the cheapest, boringest hardtail um, bridge that you could buy in the shop. And uh, yeah, everything completely, completely simple. Six string, bone nut. Nothing going on, just a solid bridge, cheapest one, £9.99 Chinese, um, uh, Chinese uh, strat style bridge, totally simple. Right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the tuner. Now this is currently, I've tuned it up to pitch. So I'm going to tune it down to where Andy has it. And as I tune down, I'm just going to give it a little pull because even tuning it down um, de destabilizes the tuning. G sharp. C sharp or D flat, F sharp instead of G, E flat. So here's the here's the conundrum. I'm going to see if I can zoom you in on this because you don't need to see what I'm doing. You need to see what's happening here. Oh yes. Okay. Uh, slightly sharp. Good enough. So first fret. Right, let's go back. First fret, E flat. Second fret, sorry. Open, E flat. First fret. Wait for it to go off. Slightly sharp. E but sharper V. Second fret. Slightly sharp. Third fret. Less sharp. Less again. And as we go up, and we get eventually up to. 12 frets pretty much on. Now let's try the B. Let's get it down to, sorry, B flat. I just tugged it a bit there to get it onto B flat. Pull it a bit more. Ooh, still a bit sharp. Okay, B flat. Open string. First fret. A mm, little bit sharp. A. Not A, it's whatever it is. C. That's in tune. C sharp, that's in tune. D, that's in tune. E flat, tiny bit flat. E flat. <laughs> F. G. That's interesting. So that's the intonation is way out. So here we go. B flat, right, we call it, yeah, that's B flat. That's a 12th fret on the B flat string. Flat. 
So that's out, and it's probably out on the E as well. Don't like the E. Yeah. Uh, ooh, that's flat. That's too long. That's interesting. So there's a difference here. Let's get the E back in tune. E flat. That E will not move when I tune it. It's not good. That's hanging up in the metal of the bridge. Uh, the sorry, the nut. Okay, that E that E flat is also a bit long. It's a bit flat. So that's a bit long. So I'm just going to write this down now because this is kind of important as well. So uh, I'm going to do it one to st six strings because I don't know what the notes are right off my top of my head. So the one is uh, flat slightly. The two is flat. Three. Stretch it a bit. The harmonic ping is a bit sharp. Now we're on. Now that's sharp to begin with. Okay. See that? Ping, harmonic. The note, flat. So that's flat too. Let's try the fourth. Up. Now that is good. Fourth is good. Where is it? Yeah, see that's quite a way forward. Fourth is good. The other ones are out of place. Stretch this one down. Whoa, look at that. Now, Andy, you said to me that the intonation was good, and it isn't. It's it's way out. Look at that. I'm going to say five flat flat. Now there there is some variation in this intonation business because, as I said, in the other little description I did about the notes going sharp near the first fret, which we'll come back to. By the way, we haven't done that business completely yet. But just as when I showed that thing about the first fret, wow, uh, that's weird. I don't know if I think we're not getting the right start point here. Let's get a plectrum. Um, yes, so how I press this note at the 12th fret, obviously, varies compared to how you press it. So there's such a huge variable involved in there. It's almost meaningless. Um, but for an average pluck, I'm just trying to get this as close as I can to tuned at the 12th harmonic. I would say that one's sharp. So that's an interesting little run of things. Right, yes, yeah, so we, we all fret differently. So it, it may be that, you know, Andy's fretting is so different from mine, um, but it actually that would be a pretty substantial difference, and you'd expect the discrepancy to be across all the strings, but there is a, a variation in here. We've got flat, 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 on the mark, very flat, a bit sharp. So I guess the four is the... Um, I can't even see what I can see now. I guess the four is the one that we can sort of pay reference to. So um, I can trust you can see that. So if we're saying that one's in place, and what we're saying about that one is it's pretty flat, that's got to come that way. This one's sharp, it's got to go that way. Um, these are all flat, so they all need to go that way. This one can't go that way because of the uh, where the screw's gone in. And this one can't move because of where the screw's gone in. So we're going to have to do quite a bit of moving of all these bits in in a minute. But for now, we just we go back to the business of trying to sort out the um, the going sharp business. Uh, I shouldn't have put that cable away because I need it. Go back to the. Hmm, I was going to say, do we need to change this first? 
I think if I stick to my principles, I think we do need to change, get the basics right before I go on and look at the troubled area. So uh, here we go again. So to do this, I will take off. Now what? We've got a reference here on the board, so I can consult that. But meanwhile, let's get this all slacked again. This is why it's good to have some uh, um, sacrificial strings on for, because just going off and on with these, and eventually they will break. They won't like being treated this way. Now, while I'm doing this, I'm going to take a, a sort of closer look at this, and I can see in here there is there is quite a bit of a damage in there. I wonder if I can get you a quick look. Now that's not going to... Shoot, I lost you. Are you still there? Oh Christ. Stop! Sorry about that. I just had to um, restart because I accidentally hit the off button in my enthusiasm. Right, now what I'm looking for here is a view of that. Oh yes. And I'm not content with that. That little thing there is causing considerable gripping, believe it or not that little rough thing where the string has dug its way into this piece of chrome. It's a little little groove there and it's holding onto the string. Okay, um, This isn't going to be great until that was renewed and it's it just kind of goes to show that the material used here even in a, a fabulous you know nice nicely made guitar is, is never going to survive Unless we get a little titanium. Was that a seal song? <laughs> anyway, so that's not great. But we can't do anything about that now. We don't. Well, I do have spares, but I don't know if I've got a. I don't think I've got a chrome one. But they would only be sort of cheap Chinese things anyway. So we've got some grooves here, and we've got it. We've got those also in the B, and we've got a bit on the G, but not a problem. So that's not good. So then we come down this end. So we, we we're kind of finding things out. This was always going to be a fact-finding mission, right? Now we come down this end and we know we've got quite a bit of um, intonation change. Now you could do the intonation change uh, adjustment by using this little device here which holds the thing and pulls it back under tension, saves it all falling to bits, but we don't need to because we've got the strings off anyway. So what we do need to do is we need to reposition these screws on the ones that have to move in a different direction. So we know the B is flat, has to come forward, so we're going to need the B screw in a different position to allow it to come forward. Now we know that the E, <coughs> gee, what is, that is over tight. The E is um, flat, so that needs to come forward too. So I'm going to just start here, as I guess, and we'll check it against the, the uh, D. I know it's not really a D now, but we're calling it a D. Um, this one's flat too, so we'll go forward with this one. There is room for this one to go forward. Now, rule of thumb is that these saddles never need to be more than, at most, a millimetre and a half away from each other. Right? Um, in fact, I can see if four is on, then this has got to come forward a bit more, if that's the truth about, about it. So I would go forward to right to the stops on the G, and then I would um, push these forward a little bit more about one and a half, and again forward. Now this may be overdone, overcompensated, but it's what we need to do to just get us in the right ballpark. And the ballpark is, with three plane and three wound, we're shortest, back a bit, back a bit, jump forward of that one, back a bit, back a bit. But these two are too flat, and this one's got to come out and be moved to the forward, 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 uh, thingy and that has to oh, come, ooh, come forward a bit. Um, we'll go to there and clamp it down again, millimeter and a half back from the D one that we thought was pretty much okay. And we said the E was quite flat as well, so we'll go forward with that one um, and we'll lock that down. We'll have a look. Now, uh, if we take the D as the good one, then this one needs to be forward again. I'm just kind of going on my now that has to come out. Um, we'll change over the screws here. They give you two positions that you can sort of move about and get the put the locking screw in whichever the right place is right for the intonation. So I'm just now putting this in there and I'm coming forward a bit. And I'm basing all of this right the second off the D that the 
intonation check told me was right. So everything else is going to work around that D. And I'm going to then tighten it back all up and recheck it. And if everything is completely A about T, as they say in a nice way, um, then I will have to reconsider. But normally it works perfectly well. So I'm just going to check my strings. Now we know we've got a problem with the surface of the locking nut. Get all these under tension. Keep an eye on where the strings are going, make sure they all feed on nicely first. And then, as always, we've got some stretching to do. Now, I think one of the things that uh, won't be good for this, let me just check something. What won't be good for this is to have those uh, locking tuner caps. Sorry, two things won't be good. is having the locking tuner uh, caps rammed down, but you have to have them, otherwise the thing won't stay in place. The other thing isn't so great um, is, I don't know if the, any of these things will fit, but they're sort of, uh, sorry, I'll come back to you in a second. Um, there are a couple of black, cheap versions. We'll see if we, we can do a test with them at least. Um, yeah, so what we don't want is is the guide, the retainer, ram down because that's going to be putting such a pressure uh, extra pressure over here that, that every time the string moves it's going to be soaring away at this which is what it's doing and it's, it's soaring into the places it's touching so definitely we don't want this as far down as it was so i'm going to take my own medicine here and to give this a chance give this a chance i'm going to go up until it isn't in under so much pressure all right and it's obviously got to keep this little angle in place, which it's doing, but that's probably one reason why that it hasn't helped to having that locked down. Also, it's going to create downward pressure when you lock the caps, but it isn't going to soar. If you take the caps off or disconnect them like, like you have, and you ram this right down, you're going to make a, a fine cheese wire soar across this gr uh, chrome, and that's what's happened. It's worn out. That's that when we can get a new one of those at pretty much anywhere or any time. I'm going to go back to A for a minute. So the rule here with this retrain, retraining, re retaining bar is really to um, have it as little as light a touch as is, as is required to um, keep the brake angle that we need. Any further than that is just not going to work. I'm just going to cut into it. Now I'm going to do this at this time in standard tuning. And the reason I'm doing that, I want to make a comparison between that and E flat. So be good to start off with this in standardized tuning and then we can drop down to E flat. Okay, so after all of that checking things out, Now, that has massively freed up the tuning at this end. It doesn't feel stoppy-goey like it did before. So definitely are not happy with that extra pressure on the uh, retaining tensioning bar. So now I'm going to go back to where I was. Now we're, we're working now with a guitar. Hopefully the intonation will be closer. I won't bother showing you the close-up. That needs a little bit of looking at. That's a bit loose. Spot on. Spot on. Go sharp settles at G. D. 
go sharp. On the attack, go sharp. That's maybe what, what happened when you were doing it. Um, when you, the attack, the attack of the note, the pick bit, often goes sharp. Now this one's showing flat. A was uh, very flat before. Wow. Now these are cheap strings. That could just be a string problem here. Oh God. All right, let's assume that is a string problem because that's so far out and everything else is in kilter. Uh, that's, that's, about, that's about right. That A is a duff string. How about that? Now you imagine throwing that into the mix on top of everything else. You know, no wonder you'd lose your mind. But that's what you get when you use one pound set of strings or cheap Chinese strings. But I, I anticipate that and know that's what the problem is. It's a duff string, not a problem with the intonation. Everything else is right and everything else is in sequence. So you can see I'm still pulling a little bit of slack out. G sharp is dead on. Okay, that's interesting. So the I'm I'm kind of now ruling out the first fret um, problem. If if it was going to be sharp, it should be really sharp here. Well, it is a bit. All right. So, what's interesting is, is when I bend the string, um, if I bend hard on the G, the lightest I can touch it when I'm on the A, two frets, second fret, that's the lightest I can get it barely playing without it going sharp. But if I squeeze, I'm about 60 cents, 20, how much am I? 20, 40, I'm about 40 cents sharp, up to 60 if I really squeeze. Now that's a combination of the first fret, this type of string, and these tall frets. Because funnily enough, if I play there. I have to squeeze a lot harder. To, well, maybe not. No, that's true. That's the bend. So the I've just real found out from my own interest that the the impact of high tall frets and the ability to push the strings sharp down here are um, increased as well closer to the nut um, because they're, uh, I wonder why that is, there's less stretch, natural stretch between here and here than there is between here and here, but somehow that doesn't cause it to go as sharp when you press down. It's, I guess it's like um, if you were standing with somebody holding a rope, you could just touch it in the middle and you could get a big dent. If you go up the other end and you touch where they're holding it, you can hardly move it, or where it's tied, you can hardly move it. It feels like you, you'd have, you know, hardly move it at all. And if you pressed with that much, same pressure here, doesn't bend it much, but the same pressure here um, does bend it more, because to move it the same distance, I could be talking bull pizzles. Um, but now I'm just going to check the height of the action here. That's the next thing, because it looks OK, but that's the one thing you may have noticed I haven't done until I got the other things stable, or as stable as we can get them. 
So what am I expecting to find at the first fret? Hmm, I don't know. Well, it's higher than point... Not much. About point four there. Well, so this is interesting because that is nearly... The G is fractionally high, but... So the high E is, is about 25 or 30 at the most. Possibly not 30, but 25, um, which is nice and low. Actually, it's, it's a fraction over 30, which is okay. The B is a bit more. The G is quite a bit more. The D uh, goes back. So the problem with this is these aren't even. These aren't even even. So it's a fault in the manufacturing, or fault is inaccuracy in the manufacturing. What I was hoping is that it would all be the same and out the same amount, which means I could sand it down from below. The fact that these are um, different uh, from each other, in other words, I can see there's a slightly bigger gap um, under the G than there is under the B, and it measures out as such, um, while the, the B is barely 30, or 0.3. The base side is actually lower. But, that's amazing. The, yeah, these, the B and the G, sorry, the G and the D are slightly higher than everything. Maybe the B, actually the B is as well. But they're only a fraction over 0.3. And interestingly, they you wouldn't expect those to push the, um, the, the guitar sharp. Still, that sounds pretty good. I mean, I can make it go sharp. Is that better than you've had it, Andy? The argument was that the open chords sound terrible. That sounds okay, doesn't it? Now if I really try... I think you'll agree that the first lot where I'm not squeezing deliberately sounded okay. Um, and everything about this tells me that the actions about, over the nut, first fret, are not... they're not in the danger zone, I'm afraid. I mean, it'd be nice if that was the solution on this. Um, but you can hear that's pretty I'm not I'm not light fisted either is sharp. Now let's just do one more check now. We had, let's do the G. Oh I'm sorry I didn't mean to be leaning on there. I hate that. Let's go back to here. Support. Thank you. Okay. G still nicely in tune. Let's drop it down by a semitone. And let's do all of them.
Now that's easier to go sharp because it's a, a, a lower tuning. Now look at this technically, I'll try and get it spot on, but okay, F sharp, first fret. G ten cents high, sharp. G sharp, 10 cents, sharp, shush, So, okay, that's interesting. We've got almost no relief in the neck at all. That's interesting. Right, so my conclusions are uh, the G tendency, because it's a stiffer string, it's a thick string, because it's, it's a thick plain one before you go to a wound one, um, it's a, it, it is playing a little sharp. Um, and the height of the thing is slightly higher than the others, which doesn't help. Um, it's not the be on that one end all of it, but so we could take it down by a tenth of a millimeter. Um, I mean, let's let's do it to see the best we can get. But um, so what I'm going to do is a test on this guitar, just and it's partly for my interest as much as anything. But I'm going to switch over. The, um, the gauge of strings. So I've got a set of 11s that I pretty much never would use because I nobody I know likes 11s. So I'm going to put a set of 11s on here and see if we get a bit more stable at the E flat with 11s instead of 10s because there's, a, there's definitely something going on here around that G that's a little bit over something. It's, it's pushing a little sharp, but it is possible to play it without too much distortion. Um, Put that there. Yeah, you can do it. So, um, you know, the notes I was playing didn't sound very terrible, but I can also, if I'm not careful, it will also go 10 cents sharp without too much trouble. So what I'm doing now is I'm just taking, sorry if it's not a very good view, I'm taking the two screw uh, locking nut bolt things off the back and I'm just going to wick this out. 
Okay, so it's got no, currently got no uh, shims under there or anything. Um, we're also, oh no, it's in there. We've got a, that's it, a little washer. Um, so we've got what looks like a, a nice flat thing there. Oh, there's a little bump there. I wonder what that's all about. Okay, so yeah, we look again at this. We've got, I've got some of these cheap Chinese ones here. I just wonder if one of those would be worth putting in for a, I wonder if it's possible. I don't know how they f f fit. They probably don't work that way. They're probably not possible because of the, uh, the way they screw in. But I just wondered if there was a is that so that group we might come up through there you never know it'd be worth might it be worth doing let's take these it's be just interesting to to see how much the um the scraped or, or sawn line makes a difference as well i mean again this as i say these are sort of cheap chinese things but one of the good things about these is they have a thing at the front which Actually, is an, an action adjuster if it would work together. I don't know if it will. Let's have a look. Does that line up? No, it doesn't bloody line up, does it? Yeah, bloody swine, you. Okay. Trust them to make their stuff custom positioned. No, that's a shame. That would have been fun. Um, yeah, so hmm, we've got the worn thing that we're going to have to probably I suggest replace um, and then do not uh, overstress the what do you call it in fact if I can just if I can do a close-up here no I can't show you that because I've taken it off for the time being um, let's look at this one is this also not going to work on there is it probably not should not could not let me just look in here and I'm, I'm certain I, n this wouldn't fit. Oh, it's the same damn thing, isn't it? Isn't it? Oh, no, it, I just put it back in there. Stupid me. Let's go to the other actual one. They make a little one there with the adjusters on, and then there's this one, which doesn't have adjusters. Again, cheap and cheerful off of... This is more the matching size, but whether it's a... I mean, it might be a direct replacement. You never know. Uh, could be might not be depends on which is the front edge and which ain't well 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 that's a, that could even be a, a change out huh, look at that well that would be fun for a little experiment this i don't know what the height of the action will be on this so it could be a mile off um, for all i know i don't even know if these these nuts will fit see yeah, yeah, yeah. no yes no yes maybe no 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 I don't think it wants to go that's a shame I thought we could have a bit of fun let's just double check that it really doesn't want to go in there uh, these ones I think uh, I think no wait a minute these I think the problem with these is they don't have a screw thread in them. They're meant for down fixing, not screw through. I could put a put a for fun. I could have put a thread on there, but pff, take too long. Okay, dokey. Well, that was fun for a possible check. Um, right. So what we got? Let's review. We've got a nut that I'm going to consider taking about a tenth of a mil off it. Um, and I'm going to do it with a flat, flat block. A flat block. I'm just going to just check it. Just going to smooth it out, basically. Okay, so we have. We've got the radius here marked on here. Comes up there, and we've got thicker at the top end narrow down the bottom end so if we're measuring from there we've got 6.2 zero it again just to be sure ok 
okay, 6.26. 626. So we'd want to go to at most 616 and we'd want it to be evenly done. So I'm taking it very easy. I wish there was some way I could polish out that. I wonder is there a way I could polish that out, do you think? Looking at my chrome. Uh, not, that's not even, e not even even. Isn't that funny how you reveal those things? Um, so you know, 616, 626. Yeah, um, it'd be interesting if there was a way I could polish out, smooth out and polish out that crinkled, sawn up bit, which I'm not sure if there is, but it would be nice. That sort of Dremel thing would do it. That's really scratchy. That's undesirable. And it will lower the area just before then, which might compromise the thing. So this is slightly curved, interestingly enough. Uh, we got 616, no, we're barely down on the original. Being metal, of course, it'd take longer to work down, but that's okay. Slow, slow and steady. So, yeah, next test will be the 11 gauge strings at E flat. Let's see if there's a an improvement on, I mean, these will be quality strings as well, so that will have a slight impact on it. Um, so the intonation should be stable. And the thing, I, the thing I'm commenting on the gauge is that um, with a light, lighter gauge string, the string becomes sort of bendier. Um, and with a um, down tuning, the same string, string becomes bendier again. So it's sort of, if you're down tuning and you've got tens, they become like nines. And the issue would be a set of nines on jumbo frets near the nut, do they go sharp? Well, yes, there will be a tendency for that to happen. Now, this thing is now completely lying to me. It's kind of like taking nothing at all off it, but it's, uh, I think it's just running slow. Um, I think getting a new one of these and then running it without the massive pressure of the res retaining bar will be a, a major improvement, um, generally. And am I at? I'm at that end. I think um, I think this metal is going to take quite a bit longer to work than when I'm used to working bone and tusk. <laughs> so I shouldn't be expecting any major slimmings downs in a hurry. Almost there. Now, as far as the slight unevenness between, or slight difference in the placement of the 
the G compared to the other strings. We can tweak that with a nut file um, very slightly. It's going to introduce a tiny bit of scratchiness into it, but um, I wouldn't be entirely confident that these things aren't already fairly rough, um, given how much it's cut into the material already. So I'm just pulling these sort of into place for a minute so I can pull up fit in the screw. Get the right one. And that one. So I'm just trying to reduce as much as possible the various um, causes for that G particularly to go sharp on pressing. But, you know, you've heard me play already um, with it playing in tune on the open chords. Um, although we can make it go sharp if we try. It, it isn't, by definition, terrible. I can't really, I'm not going to, I'm not going to attempt to um, polish out these things. I think this, the answer would be you need to order one of these um, I mean get under there so in fact there's so much pressure this is damaged as well and I think both the nut the nut um, the what you call it adjustable nut no not adjustable the, the locking nut and the retainer bar needs to be replaced the retainer bar is very cheap only about four or five quid maximum. The uh, locking nut, I don't know for the EVH one, um, but it may be, it'd be pretty standard for the one that fits from underneath. Um, Ibanez do the same thing, don't they? Okay, so yeah, that G is looking tall, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a. Since we're gonna uh, suggest replacing that anyway, let's have a, a little bit of adjustment on there. Um, we're on the what? 17, on the d d d d d G 17. Right. Let's do a tiny bit of adjustment because you do need a new one of those anyway, so it won't be any harm. And I think we need to take this down a wee fraction. Now, getting. A slot cut in here is going to be tricky because of the way they've constructed this, but I'm going to let that bother me none. I mean, the problem with this is the slot should be tilting backwards on a, in an ideal world, and they've obviously built it such that without cutting into the uh, metal, you can't really achieve that. Uh, close. Let's just try this again. Let's go back into tune. <laughs> I need to vacuum the surface here and wash my hands before we go the last bit. See, that sounds good enough. That's in tune enough. I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. I think, you know, whether it's taking off these caps that you weren't using for the time being, um, getting the intonation better down here, 
I think that's gone a long way to improving it and dropping the action here just a tiny little bit, even though uh, the G really could do with a fraction more. But I can't really see how to get this any further down without um, cutting into the top. But I still, I do still think you need to get another one because of the. Um, let's see if I can just get a tiny bit more out of it. <sighs> you do need to get another one because of the. Uh, the grooves cut by the E, particularly. That's that's a, kind of resting the tuning on there. Yeah, it's still a fraction higher. I don't think this is going to. I don't think this is going to cut any lower willingly without cutting into the top. Mm, but I, I do think you should get another one, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Okay, fiddling and faffing. It's an open D. That's as pure and pretty as it, pretty much anything I've got. So, on that basis, I'm not really sure that it's even going to help adding, um, going to a, a uh, 11 set. I think we're, there's a couple of things I'm going to recommend, obviously, about the, the um, changing these, because they're not helping tuning stability, and they certainly won't help using the tremolo. Um, so what I'm going to do is, while we're here, I'm going to, next step, I'm going to clean up a bit um, but I'm also now going to set the tremolo to only as much as it needs to hold it in place because there's we don't want it to um, have to <coughs> be rammed hard there to get it to work so I'm going to now release the tension from the strings at the back where I had it as a effectively locked down so I could do the experiments with the uh, tone uh, tuning and um, tuning stability and so on and I'm, I'm pretty convinced that if you wanted to use this with all the Floyd Rosie stuff on, then you'd be, you'd get tuning stability out of it, um, ba based on or assuming that you do the entire stretching until there's no more, um, you know, no more, um, what do you call it, uh, detuning in between. Now, when you're setting it to where you want it to bend. You only set it to the point where it moves when you bend strings, so you don't want this to happen. Where pulling down makes one go down and the other one go up. So it probably was where you had it before, and it may be that it's kind of set at that ideal optimum position, but that's where I would have it. Obviously, when you have it fully floating, um, when you have it fully floating, uh, every bend does that to the other notes. See, that's just about right. Yeah, that's good. So that's put it right out. Massively detuned. I'm trying to find if it's making it go sharp, which it was doing before.
Okay, I'm going to put locking nuts on for a minute before I do my last bit um, because there's no reason why not to. These are back to front, so let's put them on the right way and, and get them squished down. So we're going to um, let's take them out nearly all the way out. So out one, out one, out. It's coming out too far. One ish. Out one. Out one. Right, let's just um, do the tuning again. Now we've reset the locking caps. Sometimes, when you put the uh, cat, these, these locking bits on, they push the strings sharp as well. Um, hopefully that's not going to be the case here. Um, what I want to see is, now by locking these off, I want to make sure or see whether it's the something about the tremolo that's not returning to the right position or whether it's something to do with this the chicane up the end here with the, um, the nut and the strings uh, retainer bar. Okay, so now I'm locking these off for good measure, which I don't expect it to be. Ah. Andy, go with the Floyd Rose, man. That's what you paid for. Look at it. Come on. That's what you pay your money for, that. It's cut. So it goes to prove that everything about the detuning is caused by the drag of the strings trying to move backwards and forwards along uh, through those slots, which are not designed for movement and underneath this ragged bar, which is also not now designed for movement. And left to its own devices, that's perfect. I mean, I can just make sure the tuning again. Oh, is this one playing ball with me? Does it even go in? Yeah, a different bite point. That's pretty good, I've got to say. All right, I'm going to pause a minute, I think, before we run out. We're on, what are we on? Oh, well, we've already paused once. Well, we haven't gone on too long. Um, let me just check the actual time. So there's an interesting little bit of experimentation. Um, yeah, I, I just think, look, you're paying to cut this mangled end of things out of the deal to give you the tuning stability. If the problem is putting these out of tune, you notice that what I did was I stretched everything thoroughly with the locks off. Um, then I reset these up and went in just a tiny bit. So in case there was a bit of tight, a bit of untightening required, 
on a good system that isn't usually the case it's only always ever down occasionally when these locking tuners at the other end clamp too hard or they they're not designed right and they raise the tone then you have to obviously reduce here but on a good system this only ever needs to go down so you can go right to the edge tune up with that on lock these off tune these up to pitch there and perfect um, and I can play those open chords and they're sounding pretty good to me technically yes they go sharp but I bet you I could I haven't got one here to test it with but I could probably get one of my own guitars and there is a proclivity tendency for it to go slightly sharp as well um, if I you know just when I fret down there it's an it's inherent when the thing's coming off a nut and it's small at one end and you notice that it tends to by the time you get to the middle of the actual string which is somewhere a bit before the 12th fret or maybe some I don't know the, that's supposed to be half the actual length but um, when you get to around there it evens out because you've got the same amount you're, you're pulling it down the same amount at each end when it's down this if you had frets up here they would probably go crazy the other way sharp right so this is the kind of safe place to play for intonation is around the 12th fret because there is this inherent um, sharpness that goes on even if the first fret action is as good as it can be which it isn't far off here actually so um, I'm going to uh, recommend that you live with this take advantage of it because this thing is so nicely in tune and it'll be in tune all day long you paid good money for that use it honestly promise me you will um, but the important thing as I said before is to strip it back to simplicity to make sure so what I did was in stripping it back actually I found some real inadequacies or some real flaws and the flaw is this is corroded inside because this has been tightened too far down even if it's tightened the way I've got it now it's still going to cause uh, some some soaring action if you leave these off um, that's why a metal nut with a retainer becomes a saw uh, a, a string tree is a much better idea down here um, and over a tusk thing that has a bit of built-in Teflon um, but you can't do that here so you're stuck with a, a metal thing which you know the combination of this too tight and this not locked down causes soaring of course if you use this locked off all the time you don't get the soaring and it's not a problem and the soaring has moved backwards and forwards on both of these items and caused both of them to become damaged and it's so tiny but yet so profound that when when I first tuned that up, when this was under te real tension, the, the string was pulled so far into that little little mm, groove in here that this was it was literally holding the string so that when I turned the tuner, um, it wouldn't move in a direct and immediate way. You get the, there's a feeling you get after you played for years and you know when it's not moving directly, and that's an absolute immediate sign of tuning problems. So the tuning problems come from using this as a, a regular guitar with this thing on here and and this pressing down too hard um, and these become corroded so um, it is designed to work with the locks on and you can see that when it's on and you if you stretch your um, strings out really thoroughly before you ever lock it down then these become perfectly usable and truth is if if you're going to knock them slightly out of tune when you're playing um, you know you, you better off trying to modify your technique very slightly um, but even if this is out of tune gone up sharp better just tweak it back on there whatever I would recommend learning to love these because they're your savior in this guitar um, this, you know, as a, as a set of gymnastics with strings to go over, this is not a good design in my book, so I wouldn't like it. Right, I'm going to um, going to basically. Uh, is it worth stopping? Um, I'm not really. I think I put, I'm going to I'm going to give my hands a clean. I'm going to take this. No, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to take this off for a minute. And what I'm going to do is take the strings off now. I'll do this before I clean myself up. I'm going to take this off now. Um, we're going to give the whole guitar a clean up. So these are holding of strings here. So probably shouldn't have done that until I've undone these. But hey, we can always put them back on under tension so they don't immediately go in a soaring direction. 
and put them under tension one way or another. There we go. So these are, I mean, it works very good as a Floyd, Floyd Rose, I've got to say. But I understand that there's so many variables when, when you, if, if, the, if the Floyd Rose sort of bamboos, bamboozles you a bit, which is not, there's no shame in it doing that because it's, it's one of those systems that frightens everybody. Um, there are some guitar techs who just seem completely um, flummoxed by it. There are some that say it's a massively complicated thing, when in fact it's not complicated at all. It's just it's just introduces a number of variables that you've got to make sure that you take care of. And the, the biggest one of all, as I said, is the is you've got to begin with your guitar strings being fully stretched out before you ever get into locking your um, your thingy down <laughs> you know what I mean before you ever get into locking down your uh, any of your locking bits you've got to have that tuning stability um, and if you're trying to figure out whether you've got tuning stability right take the uh, take the take the bounciness of the, s the tremolo out of it. In other words, lock it down as if it was a hardtail to <coughs> while you're stretching your strings and making sure that they are fully stretched out because that way you, you can then know it's fully stretched out. Then you can go and um, loosen it back up as I did so it works as a down tremolo. Um, but having it locked down is never a bad thing because you can, you know, you can test things but if you don't lock it down uh, as in tighten up the springs and effectively to it as a hardtail you may not you may be um, pulling a note and it may be making your tremolo rise very slightly that you haven't noticed and that will introduce a degree of instability that will drive you nuts as well so minimize the variables has been my catchphrase now with this one I'm going to just still need to try and uh, I'm going to have to take this one right off to remove this broken off ball end because it's disappeared down here. Um, remember, I'm I'm taking, I'm assuming, I'm, I'm taking it as red that the A wasn't a problem in any substantial sense, but it was a bad string problem, man. Um, so I'm going to, that's my belief and I'm going to stick to it. Um, it's something I learned actually that let's get some cleaning stuff yeah I learned that uh, it, it seems to me by surprise that I used to spend hours you know trying to fight with strings if they wouldn't seem to intonate I'd end up um, you know you sometimes get the, the saddles in odd patterns here and there and I would have to live with it because it was then intonated but then I would be doubting myself thinking have I got this right because that's not how they're supposed to intonate and um, it turns out that um, I, I had a I remember I had a guitar through once and it was it just wouldn't intonate properly in the sequence and I'd, I kept saying to myself what is it about you know this sequence is consistent throughout every guitar I've ever set up it always comes to the same basic pattern if you know assuming you're using a, you know, a guitar with this scale length, you know, either a Gibson or a Strat, something in that range, not anything exotic. Um, if you've got a standard guitar with a sort of familiar conventional uh, scale length um, and uh, these kinds of strings made by these kind of manufacturers, you always end up with, you know, the following pattern. And if you don't, then what's wrong? It, what can be wrong? And actually, the only thing that can be wrong is the type of string um, you're working with. Now, that could be that it's a, a fault in the factory and it's, it's a QA fault, quality assurance fault, and somebody's had a bad day and the machine's made them slightly out of spec. When you think about it, it's, it wouldn't be surprising if that happened because, um, you know, it's a very fine-tuned thing making, no pun intended, making guitar strings that are exactly the same weight and the same exact construction the same number of turns on the thing every time you know it's a very precise thing and it must be there must be variations along the way that that will have an impact and what there certainly are are variations when you find yourself 
in possession of um, fake strings, which there of which there can be quite you know quite a lot out there. Is this a hole? I think there's a dent in here. Nothing I can do about that. Um, yeah, so there are, there are fakes, and one of the fastest ways that you'll note know that you end up buying a set of fake strings, and it obviously expensive elixirs are the best ones for them to fake because they're getting proper money's worth out of it. But if you're if you've got fake strings, the fastest way you'll know is that they don't seem to want to intonate in the standard pattern. And the thing is, if you if you're like me and you've come to trust the pattern explicitly as I do now, the, t the two groups, staggered groups of three, then as soon as I see a string out of that sequence, I immediately suspect the string and ditch it. Um, and that is, when I first did that, I was thinking to myself, no, that this isn't going to work out this way. I'm, I'm just, you know, my theory is going to be disproven. So I got, I got the string, tore it off, <laughs> stuck another one on, Lo and behold, it intonated perfectly into the position in the sequence that you would expect it to go. Ta -da! So that was a, a very good outcome, and I've done it ever since, and it's proved to be true ever since. Now here we've got these reinforced strings. The funny part is that they're reinforced at the ball end, which really isn't, isn't going to... When you think about it, these don't really make any difference because they've got a nice X. Where's the reinforced bit? Yeah, the other one's had a little, maybe they're extra wound there, but they, the other one's had a little gold wiring thing going on there. I feel cheated. Right, um, anyway, what was I saying? Oh yeah, um, when I, Ever since then, I've been, uh, if I get the thing that goes out of sequence, uh, a saddle that intonates out of sequence, um, I bin it and put another string on. The reason for that is that there's no, there can be no reason. You know, if, if we, if we kind of, um, what's the word? I don't know what the word is. If we m magicalize it, you know, if we, if we, if we, don't demystify this business of setup, and it really isn't that mysterious. But if, we, if we're still in the mystery of it all, um, then it's very easy to distrust what we've done and think that we've made a mistake, and therefore that's why the thing isn't tuning up or going into the right position. Um, and that's the, a mistake to think like that, because, oh, hellfire, low battery mode. Damn you. How do we get out of this? Uh, can I... Right, I'm going to have to charge up. Um, look, I'm just, all I'm going to do, I think we've had enough video. I'm going to stop this now before the battery dies. I'm just going to restring this. It's, it's polished up. I'm going to stretch it out and I'm going to set it up with the tremolo and I'm going to recommend that's how it stays. Okay, listen, thank you for watching. Sorry, it was a bit of a, a ramble. I'm also going to tighten up these jack um, sockets, but my phone has had it for the day. Um, thank you for watching. Um, and Andy, I hope you get the thing I was saying about simplifying it, because it's actually a great system, it's a great guitar, but we can easily overthink it and get totally freaked out by it. Thank you for watching. I'll see you tomorrow, Andy, when you come to pick it up.